To quote the great Jimi Hendrix, knowledge speaks, but wisdom listens. You're listening to The Wisdom Project, a podcast that does just that. We listen. My name is Doug Boyd, director of the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History in the University of Kentucky Libraries. In the past few years, the Nunn Center has conducted several oral history projects documenting various aspects of Kentucky's bourbon industry. One thing that I've learned from leading these projects is the fact that when you look past the tasty cocktails in glasses or julep cups, look past the bottles on the shelves in the stores, and you examine the process, you examine the historical context of the business side of things, you discover that this is an intense, challenging, and really competitive business. The bourbon business is also, at times, a seriously dangerous business. The process of making bourbon involves aging the bourbon in charred white oak barrels. These barrels are stored in a warehouse. I've been inside these warehouses, thousands of barrels containing tens of thousands of gallons of aging bourbon whiskey, barrels all neatly stacked in incredibly organized and systematic fashion. Walking through one of these warehouses, there's a beautiful smell, the mixture of aging bourbon and wood. In fact, there's wood everywhere inside this warehouse. This is where a lot of the magic happens. But this is also a very dangerous combination. Tens of thousands of gallons of highly flammable liquid being stored in wooden barrels, stacked from floor to ceiling, stored in old wooden buildings. What about the fire? Will you talk about the fire? Sure. Uh, sad day, but uh, you know, devastating. You never just didn't know exactly what was happening. Uh, you knew it was bad. It was obvious yeah. to see. That was Max Shapira, president of Heaven Hill Distillery, describing November 7th, 1996. November 7th, 2016 marks the 20th anniversary of a devastating fire at the Heaven Hill Distillery in Bardstown, Kentucky. In fact, it was one of the most devastating and destructive distillery fires of all time. The Heaven Hill Distillery is situated about a mile outside of Bardstown, a lovely town in Nelson County, Kentucky. It's about 40 miles outside of Louisville, and it's home to several distilleries. Heaven Hill is known for such iconic brands as Heaven Hill, Evan Williams, Elijah Craig, Larceny, Old Fitzgerald, Parker's Heritage Collection, Henry McKenna, just to name a few. Heaven Hill was started in 1935 by members of the Shapira family in Bardstown. It's not only one of the largest bourbon companies, but one of the largest spirit companies in the world now. This global company continues to be run by the third generation of the Shapira family, specifically Max, who we heard from earlier. Another important note in bourbon history and genealogy, Heaven Hill has deep roots with the Beam family. Yes, as in Jim Beam. Now, Joseph Beam, first cousin to Jim Beam, was the original master distiller for Heaven Hill. In 1946, Earl Beam, the son of Jim Beam's brother, Park, migrated from Jim Beam to Heaven Hill. Later, Earl's son, Parker Beam, became Heaven Hill's master distiller. An iconic master distiller, indeed. Now his son, Craig Beam, has now followed in his footsteps and become master distiller as well. In fact, Craig was at the distillery when the fire broke out. Well, I was here uh, on that day, and that was uh, November the 7th. It was uh, about 80 degrees, you know, which is kind of unusual for that time of the year. Uh, The wind had been blowing all day long. Reports were that the wind was blowing 60 to 70 miles per hour. And uh, there were some storms they were talking about some severe weather coming in that late that afternoon. Uh, I was down at the old distillery in, in the office, and then I heard somebody say the warehouse is on fire up here on the hill. So I stepped out of the office, ran out of the office, and looked up, and I could see flames shooting out of the window. They were shooting out the window. In fact, they were shooting in the sky, 35 stories. And so immediately, me and several guys went up to the top of the uh, of the hill where the warehouse was and uh, of course we all had radios on at, on us at the time so radioed back down to the distillery and told everybody to, which we knew was going to lose power probably anyway so uh, of course everybody needed to you know be shutting everything down be, be get, thinking about getting out and uh, so that's what we did and then the power on the warehouses up here there's a big switch uh, gear out here and out here in the yard out here around the warehouse we cut all that off to main power going to the other warehouses and uh, 
just sit back and watch it unfold and uh, just kind of felt helpless, you know. I can't imagine how helpless he felt, but help was on the way. Firefighters were notified and were quickly on the scene. So we had oral history interviews with Max Shapira, the president of the company, Craig Beam and Parker Beam, the master distillers. But we were missing one perspective on this fire. So recently I interviewed Charles Montgomery. He goes by Chuck. Chuck Montgomery is the assistant fire chief in the Bardstown Fire Department. In 1996, he was a volunteer firefighter who helped fight the Heaven Hill Fire. Let's go to that day. So it's November 7th, 1996. You're at work um, and you've got your pager on. Mm. Now at the time when I heard it go off, we had had on, I think the 4th, there was an electrical fire at one of the other warehouses. And I, I don't think it was the same warehouse that it started at, but we had, so it, it was like, okay, they're getting they're having electrical issues again. So I'm not able to leave work for every little thing that comes down. If it's something significant, you know, I can go to the supervisor and say, hey, I, can, I, I need to go. But at that time, I didn't really give it much attention. And then they set the pagers off again, which is what they typically will do. They'll continue to set as it escalates and to let everybody know, hey, this is... This is beyond what we've got on scene. We need some more help. And uh, at that point, somewhere uh, after that first uh, page went out, I went outside and everybody was starting to gather outside and you could just see this massive column of smoke and flame coming up over top of the trees from the other side of town. And I went and said, I've got to (laughs) go. So Chuck leaves work very quickly, heads to the fire station where he gets his gear on, jumps in a truck, with other firefighters and heads to the scene. And, uh, when I got there, the uh, the hydrant was so far away from where this original warehouse had started that they ran out of supply hose getting the getting the water to it. So I had to pick up where that one left off and drop my supply hose coming to warehouse J, which was the second one that uh, warehouse I was already. Uh, by the time I got there, probably 80% involved. And uh, I dropped my supply line to the truck that they were wanting the water to go to because there were actual crews that were still in Warehouse J. They had gone inside to try to see what they could do to get some blocking there, putting water on the fire, if there were whatever was starting on Warehouse J. But it was... Uh, starting to heat up very fast no. in-house, in the warehouse J, which was the second warehouse that ended up burning. In this particular location of the distillery grounds, the warehouses were laid out in a grid. Now, they were a fair distance from each other, but because the flames were so high and the wind was so strong, flames were beginning to reach out and affect the buildings that were adjacent. So the firefighters were really trying to contain this fire rather than fight it. The buildings that were currently burning were burning so hot and so massively, there was just nothing they could do. If the storm front had not been a factor, uh, with the collapse, we probably still would have had an issue with, uh, I think, C and D were the two warehouses down below I still would have had the running issue with the fire taking off, but the the wind was uh, steady at 50 miles an hour and it was gust to 75 and higher, which just turned Warehouse I into a blowtorch. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it, it truly is a blowtorch because the, the warehouse was, the warehouses at the, the uh, up on the hill were around 400 feet apart. And the heat was just like you were standing right next to it with the wind pushing it. Talk about what that, you know, I mean, again, for those of us who've only ever experienced fire in a fireplace, um, talk about what that kind of heat feels like. It's like getting up next to that fireplace and standing there till you just can't stand it anymore and you have to move. It was like that, with dealing with that, because uh, when I got my truck in place, which ended up getting stuck because we, they, uh, I was told to pull down next to Warehouse J and pull... Uh, a uh, hose around the backside and start wetting down the outside and they had walked on the ground but nobody drove a vehicle over it anything as big as a fire truck and ended up burying the truck that I was driving all the way to the axles so 
So we still went ahead and pulled the, the hose off, myself and uh, another firefighter that was on the truck, Dale Sagercy. Uh, we went around the back side of the warehouse and started working on the from that side, on the side that was closest to I. But it was so hot that, and the wind was blowing so hard that when uh, we tried to spray the water up on the side of the building, the wind would just push the water right back toward us. You, I wasn't getting the, the distance that I, that I needed to effectively wet the side of the building down. And it was it was just, and this was a 150 PSI stream. You know, it wasn't like a, a little garden hose. You got your finger over the end of it. I mean, this was, you know, 150 PSI, and it's it's breaking the stream. Or the wind's pushing so hard, it's breaking the stream over before I can even get any distance at all. So, it, I mean, it really feels like... Um all these factors are working against you. Oh, everything that can impact a fire and make it worse was there that day. You had, you know, the, the fuel source is significant. You know, something you don't want to deal with is gasoline or alcohol in uh, uh, controlled fires. And then you've got the wind, which is another issue that pushes the fire. So it's got all the air that it needs. You know, and then limited water sources. You know, so everything that could be against being successful at that point when we first got there was working against us. But in addition to the wind, you're also dealing with an incredible amount of liquid fire. And to make things worse, these warehouses were on a hill. Well, that that's what ended up getting some of the other warehouses as it started to collapse. You just had all these bourbon barrels being crushed underneath the weight of the building themselves, and then you just get this plume of fire that just balls up, just like throwing a cup of gasoline on a fire. It just welled up. The, there was just a, a almost, I think they said it was around an 18-inch uh, deep worth of uh, bourbon that was running from Warehouse I out of, out of Warehouse I and down the hill to the other two warehouses that were in front of it 18 inches. 18 inches deep and that's what ended up getting the two warehouses down from because we're warehouse a hill, out. right oh massive hill it's a, it's a, you know. the fire was eventually contained and according to chuck the embers continued to burn for several days the flames took out seven warehouses and as chuck mentioned the fire ran down the hill and destroyed most of its distilling building when i heard this story for the first time my first question at that point was what about the yeast? Yeah, well, the yeast was saved. Yes. In fact, I just had got through making it uh, about an hour before that happened, and we just put it in a cooler box that sat on the top floor, and uh, so it was safe. And so, yeah, so several days after that, we were able to go down in a high lift and go up in the window. I think it was up on the fifth floor. It went through the window and got the got the jug yeast out and brought it brought it out and put it in a local liquor store here in the cooler box till we found something else to do with it. One thing I find incredible is that there were no major injuries, no fatalities, for either the staff or the firefighters. This fire on November 7th, 1996, could have been the end of Heaven Hill. One of the headlines said, 2% of world's bourbon lost. Distiller plans fast recovery. President Max Shapiro reflects on the aftermath. The very next day, I don't want to say it was business as usual, but it was as business as, usual, as normal as it could be. The bottling facility was up and running. Whiskey was being taken out of other warehouses for processing. Shipping was going to our customers. Everybody was at work when they were supposed to be. It was like, from that standpoint, you didn't miss a beat. Yeah, there were some, you know, things of trying to get your gaps in your inventory filled and production, how you're going to source production and do various things, get your distillery back in operation or buy another distillery or whatever we were going to do. And those, all, those plans all took some period of time to uh, develop and implement. But, um, you know, when you have a big catastrophe like that, you say, oh, my goodness, are we going to be able to survive this kind of thing? But... Uh, it turns out that really wasn't even an issue. I mean, that was, you know, was the support from our, our family of Heaven Hill employees was almost unbelievable. Said, and we, we're going to do anything we can do to make sure that operations are as normal as they possibly can be. And while that was a momentary 
setback, it was certainly something that we overcame in a fairly easy style over a period of some years. So the company demonstrates incredible resiliency in bouncing back. But they couldn't do it alone. Remember in the beginning when I said, this is an incredibly competitive business? Well, it is. However, in the moments, in the aftermath after the fire, the bourbon industry rallied around Heaven Hill. But yes, uh, everybody chipped in the next day. We you know, got phone calls from all of the distilleries, all of our colleagues, everybody was you know, lending a hand and help, you know, be willing to help us out and do anything possible uh, that they could. And, and uh, some of our uh, competitors, the Brown and Foreman Steering there at early times, they picked up some production for us. And in Jim Beam, they, they picked up some production for us. Both Jim Beam and Brown Foreman rose to the challenge. Chris Morris from Brown Foreman Wood for Reserve describes what they did for Heaven Hill. We didn't <clears throat> sell whiskey to Craig, we made his whiskey for him and his father because the distillery was down. So what's your grain recipe? Uh, bring the, your yeast into the facility. And so it was just our time and talent and facilities working for Heaven Hill because they needed help. Once again, President Max Shapira. But, but it said something else about not just our company. But it says something about the whole industry. There's, I mean, this is an unusual industry. Uh, there's not that many Kentucky bourbon producers. And we may kill each other to sell that last bottle in XYZ store in a lower part of town somewhere, wherever it might be around the country, around the world. But when there's a problem, for, e, for an individual member or for the individual, for the industry collectively, this is an industry that works together as really and uh, to, to help solve both industry problems or maybe even a specific company problem. So specifically with regard to the fire, we had calls from any number of, of our competitors, but at this time, people wanting to make certain that things could go as smoothly as possible for assistance, both in terms of providing some production capacity to produce some whiskeys for us, to fill in with some whiskeys that could be married into our whole continuity of product. So this was a, this was a, a, a time when somebody could have just said, well, let them sink or swim, you know, they're a competitor, but it just shows how remarkably close this industry is when, as we would say, the ox is in the ditch. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, we kill each other to sell that last right. bottle somewhere, but when there's a real problem, there's a real sense of camaraderie and assistance amongst the, amongst the companies. I cannot think of another industry that would react this way. This makes me proud. When I asked Chuck Montgomery if the Bardstown Fire Department had a lifetime supply of bourbon supplied by Heaven Hill, he said they get cookies. We both agreed it's probably illegal for Heaven Hill to give away bourbon. As I left the fire station that day, though, I told him he should celebrate on November 7th. He'd earned it. So if you think about this, it doesn't have to be on November 7th. If you think about this fire, think about the workers of Heaven Hill. Think about Chuck and the other 120 or so volunteer or full-time firefighters who fought that fire and continue to fight fires to keep our people and our bourbon safe. I will raise a glass on November 7th and toast you all. Thanks for listening. The Wisdom Project podcast is brought to you by the Louis B. Nunn's Center for Oral History in the University of Kentucky Libraries. It's hosted and produced by Doug Boyd and Copana Terry. J.D. Carruthers was the assistant producer on this episode. The music is written by Doug Boyd. The full interviews used in this interview are available in the archive at www.kentuckyoralhistory.org. They are searchable using our super cool search system called Ohms that makes the audio and video discoverable. You can find other episodes of The Wisdom Project at thewisdomproject.life. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcasting platform. If you like The Wisdom Project podcast, say something in the form of a review on iTunes. It really does matter. Like The Nun Center on Facebook or check out our blog at nuncenter.org. Follow Copana and I on Twitter at at Douglas A. Boyd and at The Real Copana. 
Stay tuned for the next episode of The Wisdom Project.